Charlie the Pope Final. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. So welcome everybody to my second vlog video. I'm now at week eight of the um, ATPL theory course. Uh, mid this is the Tuesday of, of week eight. And uh, last week we did our first progress tests. So for the IASA program, we have, um, I think it's 14 subjects that we're studying. Um, we, we split them into phase one and phase two. So for phase one, we're studying principles of flight, power plant, airframes and systems, electrics and electronics, instrumentation, human performance, and meteorology. Just so you can see, there you go. Wah. Bunch of books, really heavy, and that's that. So last week we done um, we done exams for each of those subjects, and I got an overall score of I think it was seventy four percent. Yeah, not as much as I hoped. I mean, I, I could have got more had I studied more. Um, question bank type uh, scenarios. Instead, I just relied on what I'd gone through in class along with, um, all right, let me, let me break it down. So the course runs like this. You have a timetable. Every day you go to class from 8.40 in the morning until sometimes 4.30, sometimes 6.30, it depends. Um, but usually it's up to about 4.30 in the afternoon, at which point you then do CBTs. And the CBT is like your computer-based training where you refresh what you've learned in some of your classes or you're preparing for um, what's to come in, in, the, in, the, in the classes uh, coming up. Okay, let me just fix this, sorry. Okay, all right, so that being the case, um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Of these seven books, uh, so yeah, you do these courses, you do the um, uh, CBTs, and at the end of uh, seven, well, during our seventh week, we done um, a number of exams called PT tests, progress tests, and that's it's not an official exam. It's really a school internal exam, just to gauge how you're getting on, have you grasped what, we've, what you've gone through in class, um, do you need to supplement your studies in the evening and do a bit more work, okay, if there's time to do that. So just to let you know, uh, what I've learned from that is, um, yes, you sit in class, you listen attentively to what the teachers have to say, but then you really, or I do, I need to um, do a lot more questions from you know, like exam questions or, or questions from the end of each chapter just to reinforce what I've learned. It's one thing reading the material and understanding it but it's another thing answering the questions and the questions put the knowledge you've studied uh, from a different sort of perspective so you can think about it from different angles and if you haven't done that then during the exam you're going to find there's not enough time to really um, you know, twist the, the subject to fit what the question is asking you. So, um, key learning point from uh, progress test one, practice a lot more exams. Some people have already started using this third party um, question bank online, Bristol, um, and I think I'm going to start doing that as well. Um, the books are huge, so a big challenge I'm finding is Yes, you sit in class for eight hours, you then spend another few hours in the evening reading the books and going through CBTs. How do you recall what you've studied six weeks ago <laughs> at the beginning of the course or when you're being asked in the exam? You've got so many different chapters, so many different formulas, so many different topics to remember or, or have to recall. So this whole exam really is not a test of your knowledge is a test of your ability to recall information. It's a memory test. Okay. Um, I prefer an open book method because 
if you're testing, does the person know information? Well, they can, if they know where to get it, that's fine. I don't need to memorize things. I, as long as I know how to get to information that I need. If I'm on an aircraft, I need some information. I should be able to, okay, go to, I know the manual is over here. Let me check the manual. But to have to memorize things and, and have it in my short-term memory to answer the exams is a little, little bit um, frustrating. I'd rather just have an open book method. However, that's not they're not going to change the exams for me, so I have to adapt my learning style to match uh, the exa what the exams require. So let's go through what we've covered. Well, not not in detail, but in meteorology, for example, it's, um, we've gone through 13 chapters now. We've covered the atmosphere, um, so things like the tropopause, the troposphere, pressure. Uh, we talked about ISA pressure, so ISA standard, things you may have done in the PPL. So you should know that 1013.25 is the uh, standard pressure level at ISA. The temperature is 15 degrees um, and the density level it, or the density is 1225 um, millibars. Is it millibars? No. 1225 grams per cubic meter. And this goes up uh, through the troposphere up to the tropopause. The temperature has a lapse rate of about 2 degrees according to ISA per thousand, meter, uh, per thousand feet up to the tropopause, at which point you have a, what's called an isothermal layer, meaning the temperature ceases to lapse, it, it ceases to decrease, it, it stays uh, constant for a, a number of feet. Um, you should know the different layers in the atmosphere. Right. That's pressure, there's density, there's being able to understand um, a certain formula like 96T over P, so you get your pressure altitude, um, how to t tell what density altitude you're at, um, temperature, humidity, you know, things like your humidity mixing ratio, the, uh, yeah, so my head's Full of information from, from different topics right now. Uh, then it gets interesting because you start learning about adiabatics and stability, turbulence, altimetry. I guess the area where, uh, so did I pass meteorology? I got 74% um, instead of 75 and I, I think had I studied a bit more on winds um, that would have done me good because you need to know things like geostrophic wind, Coriolis force, um, geostrophic wind, Coriolis force, pressure gradient force and how the wind is going to behave once you move from the surface up and how it behaves over the sea. You have something called veering, you have bank backing and these are all terms that I, you know, if you've never used before you have to learn them and then you get quizzed about them. So um, then we got instrumentation uh, where we go through once again some basics of the atmosphere we also understand um, the sources um, for our instruments so we have the pitot and static sources and what how your instruments respond if there's an error or a blockage or a leak in, in these devices uh, okay a useful thing is a useful mnemonic we learned was ice t and that's the corrections you make to go from your indicated um, display to your true airspeed. From your indicated airspeed to your true airspeed. Because you get your indicated, you get your um, your um, corrected or cali cali calibrated airspeed. Um, and the corrections you have to make to get them to the next level. Um, so that's your air. Then we learn about the. Um, there's two types of really main. Temp gauging the temperature is done in two ways. You have an, uh, a, di a direct reading probe and you have a remote reading uh, thermometer. So the direct thermometer is one that's sticking out the window in a small plane, and will you have a bimetallic strip which reacts to the temperature and moves the gauge and tells you the what what the temperature is. 
Uh, then you have the remote read-in type, which is what's used on larger aircraft, it's more expensive, and it's made with a platinum strip, and which effect, uh, has a res, uh, sorry, an electric circuit, and that uh, platinum strip responds to the temperature, uh, increasing or decreasing the resistance of the electric circuit, thereby uh, the indicator telling you how warm or cold the temperature is. Um, yeah, I won't go into aspiration, I won't go into too much detail about that, but these are things that we need to know. Um, the pressure altimeter, oh, so before I go any further, we have the airspeed indicator, that's another instrument. Um, so knowing what feeds the airspeed indicator, well, it's dynamic pressure plus static pressure. Well, so dynamic Total pressure minus static pressure gives you dynamic pressure. So dynamic pressure is what's known as Q, um, and that's the indicated airspeed. Key point, if you go up uh, to another, uh, as you uh, ascend through the atmosphere, the pressure level drops. So you're, to maintain a steady indicated airspeed, your true airspeed has to increase. So you're actually flying a lot faster over the ground, um, or the equivalent of much faster over the ground to keep the same indicated airspeed because there's less air molecules coming into your pitot uh, pressure sensor device. Uh, pressure altimeter, this is calibrated from uh, for ISA from sea level all the way to the moon. Um, and yeah, so your altimeter tells you how high and or how low you are, based on the amount of ambient or static pressure in, in the air. Okay, um, there are different types of um, altimeters. There's a simple one, I believe, if, if I remember correctly. There's the sensitive, and there's the servo. Uh, yeah, one of them has. Uh, the best one out of them has a E and I bar inside, so it has an electromagnetic um, force. So it's more sensitive and gives you a more accurate reading of your uh, altitude. Or am I thinking of the VSI, which is also a static uh, port fed device. Um, but it's just it has a choke inside to, to sort of delay the response of the movement and your change of height. So it's kind of like, uh, it shows you the movement that you've done a, a few moments ago. Mach meter, I won't go into that. Um, air data computer, I won't go into that either. Uh, terrestrial magnetism, the direct indicating compass. Hmm. That's where it gets really interesting, you get this. Because um, the compass, how do you, you know, it's very important when you're navigating to know which direction you're flying. Um, are you getting closer to your destination or not? Uh, what are the effects of the Earth's magnetic field um, over your directional instruments? Uh, so you have something called magnetic dip. The, f the further north or south you go from the equator, you will have a stronger uh, magnetic dip force affecting your... Um, compass. So if you're flying west, if you're accelerating west or if you're accelerating east, you're going to get the, the pointer trying to be pushed away from, well, it's getting pushed by the aeroplane with the acceleration and then the compass grows, it's going to respond. Uh, so these are things you need to know. How is the, the compass going to react to you accelerating or decelerating? On different headings, whether they be east or west or north or south. A good thing to know is that north and south you're not going to get any um, deviation, should we say. Um, and then you go into gyroscopes, which is a spinning rotor held on an axis, it could be vertical or horizontal. So let's say if you want to use that as a, as a sort of direction indicator, You'd line it up with your north or, or your runway heading, whichever north you want to calibrate it with, whichever direction you want to calibrate it with. And then uh, once it's up and running, um, it should maintain its position 
you have a sort of cage around it uh, which moves and then but that's only in one plane if you wanted to have another plane as well you would have another cage in a different direction so that the wheel stays in its position no matter what movement is happening around it you have something called precession rigidity um, so rigidity is the ability of the rotor to maintain on its uh, course without veering shall we say and um, you have something called precession that means if you put, apply a force to it it's going, is it going to move or not and if so how far in which direction so you have precession and you have rigidity rigidity is its inertia or its uh, resistance to to move and you get more rigidity by spinning it faster or adding a bit more weight to it and there was another method of adding rigid increasing rigidity anyway that's a direction um, that's your gyroscope which powers your directional gyro indicator and your artificial horizon along with your turn and slip coordinator and turn coordinator that's where we've reached in um, instrumentation principles of flight very simple subject um, it's common sense really a lot of it but I failed the exam or well, the test when I say failed I, that was the worst score I got I got 55 percent not very good um, although I do know the answers to the questions I, I just it, I'm not sure why I didn't do too well I think I didn't read the questions and answers properly so some of them may, were, were similar um, but yeah it, it, so principles of flight is to do with things like uh, aerodynamic force Bernoulli's um, theory on uh, is it the, the pressure the total pressure you have the Venturi effect so what causes lift what makes an aer aeroplane fly what are the different forces what are the controls the, for flying an air, aircraft um, stability uh, things like adverse your um, great so you can see it, it, your brain really gets loaded with information we can finish, power plant is, is made up of two, two topics it's piston engines and jet engines so the piston engine is is where we reached um, we completed the piston engine section for PT1 and now we're just starting uh, the jet engine section thankfully I passed the, the piston engine exam but the jet engine I tell you for me that's my favorite topic so far my favorite subject is gas turbines and that is um, yeah, you have the in piston engines you have a four four step process for your uh, piston engine you have your intake of air your compression four stroke process sorry it's called the Otto cycle you have your intake your compression your combustion not explosion combustion and finally exhaust and this repeats itself and you have a number of pistons all working uh, simultaneously at different steps of that four step process um, you have a crankshaft, you have a camshaft, and you have um, a carburetor to, to feed the air, unless you have a direct in injection. And then you have um, these spark plugs um, at the head of each piston or cylinder. And you have a fuel inlet, a fuel valve, which feeds either the carburetor into the air intake um, inlet valve and then you have um, yeah sorry brains overloaded anyway that's piston engines very interesting topic I didn't particularly enjoy it but gas turbines yes I really like that four, four steps again but it's called the Brayton um, pro Brayton cycle and this is a four step process again you have what's called su um, suck Bang, so suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Okay, 
when the teacher mentions this in class, everybody starts laughing. But yeah, so it sucks the air in, it squeezes the air, it compresses it, uh, and then combustion occurs, uh, or combustion is performed, and that is this uh, bang, and blow is the exhaust. Different types of uh, jet engines, you've got uh, the turbo type, one that's got sort of turbo um, compressor, it's like a turbine, and then you've got axial. Anyway, they, I can tell you all about jet engines now, I mean, when they were invented and uh, which companies developed them and so forth. Uh, but yeah, we, we were shown a video about Rolls-Royce, how they got into the jet engine uh, industry. Um, uh, it was in the 1940s, I've got the exact date here. Um, and the development of the jet engine from that point on. Okay, so, um, but otherwise the concept goes back to the time of somebody called Hero. I, th I believe he was from Greece during the times the olden days of like Aristotle or those, those people. So somebody called Hero and he had this device which was used to entertain people. It was a steam ball with an outlet on either side which would spin around. So that's the jet engine concept. Uh, but yeah, really interesting, really fascinating. And uh, that's my favorite topic, jet engines. And if you were to ask me, do I want to fly um, a, pro a propeller airplane or a jet turbine? I would select a jet turbine every time. Okay. Um, airframes and systems, we covered hydraulics. Um, we covered the oil system, the landing gear. Um, now we're doing pneumatics, so that pneumatics wasn't covered in PT1, but we're doing it now. So when PT2 comes around and towards the end of July, we'll be asked about that as well. Um, anything interesting there? Something about you get these um, the wheels on the landing gear, um, different types of wheels. You have something called a split wheel. Uh, you have something called a flange, which also uh, brings chuckles to students when they hear that word. Um, interesting device within or component within the wheel called a, I don't remember the exact name, but it's a, it's a fuse. So just like in an electric circuit, you have a fuse that if the, the current is exceeded, it will burn out and blow. Likewise, in these um, aircraft tires, you have fuse so as if the thermal if the pressure increases and the heat rises within the tire past the point this fuse will melt it will pop out and all the air will um, exit from the tire in a controlled manner and that prevents the tire exploding very very um, interesting topic um, for me what else so how aircrafts are structured how they're made um, you have something called the semi-monocoque, the monocoque. Um, yeah, I don't remember all of the names I've had right now. Different types of uh, aircraft design. Um, hydraulics to power the, the landing gear. The different uh, components of the aeroplane. And then we've got electronic, electrics and electronics. We completed DC electrics for the uh, PT1. Now we're doing AC 